Hi, uh, my name is Clarence, and I'm a graduate student working with Professor Stephen Forrest at the University of Michigan. And uh, today I'll be talking about some of the methods that we've been exploring at uh, putting down um, adhesive patterns for uh, interacting with cells as part of thrust area one. So before I begin, uh, I really want to motivate this discussion by asking a question. Now, we've seen throughout the past few decades on how the advances in semiconductor uh, production technologies have really advanced the integrated circuit and how it's been able to bring this technology uh, at a scalable and low cost fashion for the consumer. And nowadays we have computers uh, everywhere essentially. And the question that we are really asking is, can we take this kind of technology or similar technologies and apply this to the scope of tissue engineering uh, in terms of both scaling and parallel processing and hopefully do the same thing. So uh, with that, the contents of today's talk that I'll be giving is just a brief introduction on some of the methods that we uh, put down material with. Um, and then we move on to some of the uh, actual technologies that we use these methods for uh, and some of the challenges. And then finally, we'd be talking about the applications of such technologies towards CellMet and some expectations that we have uh, for them in the future. So to begin uh, our discussion, um, the fundamental technology that we see uh, in a lot of the groups involved in Thrust1 is uh, evaporation essentially. So whenever we talk about putting material down, uh, the term we typically use is deposition. So uh, vacuum thermal evaporation or VTE is one of the methods that we use to deposit material. So uh, it's a physical vapor deposition technique. So uh, the source materials that we use is what's gonna end up being on the surface of whatever we decide to deposit on. We don't use any chemistry whatsoever to react uh, materials onto a surface. So the uh, conditions which these tools operate in typically are under high vacuum. So that's 10 to the minus four as I listed here. A fun fact that uh, we can take note of is that this kind of pressure is actually very similar to what we find as we move towards the boundaries of space in our upper atmosphere. Now, outer space itself is a few orders of magnitude uh, lower, much more closer to zero pressure, but it's just fun to uh, know that. So the reason why we have such low pressures is because uh, the materials that we're depositing, such as metals like aluminum, gold, silver, or even oxides like silicon dioxide, uh, that's just highly purified sand, you can think of it like that. These materials, they're very stable if you think about it uh, in atmosphere. If I put a block of gold on a table, it's not going to disappear into gas. Um, so in order for us to actually deposit stuff, we have to turn it into a gaseous form. So uh, the classic experiment that we can think of uh, in terms of this in terms of explaining this is uh, a cup of water. Now, if we put a cup of water inside a vacuum chamber, after we passed a certain pressure, like as we lower it, the water spontaneously starts to boil. And that's because we've essentially lowered the uh, temperature threshold such that uh, water can now boil in room temperature. And the thermal evaporators work under a very similar principle. So the way that we heat up these materials, uh, the standard way that we use in our labs is uh, resistive heating. Now, the common household item that you'll find uh, using the similar method of heating is your clothing iron. So you plug it into the wall, and you run a current through it, and the current will resistively heat a uh, piece of metal, essentially, and transfer heat that way. So um, that's how this technology works. Um, so uh, to explain some of the issues with uh, VTE, we'd have to refer to the bottom right diagram. So uh, just a brief aside, 
uh, typically when we generate patterns on our samples, in this case, uh, our sample is labeled substrate, um, we use something that we call a mask. And this is essentially just a blocking layer with windows cut into them. And obviously the window would allow material to pass through and hence you'd form patterns that way. Now, the key issue though with these systems is actually how the source uh, transfers the material from uh, the red part as we see in the label down to the gray part where the substrate is. Now the arrows indicate the direction in which material travels and as you can see it goes everywhere. Um, and so if you open up one of these chambers you'd actually see that for example if I decide to evaporate gold I cover the entire chamber with gold. Um, now everything is line of sight so obviously the backside of the substrate wouldn't have any material. But uh, this also causes other problems such as material utilization which I've listed uh, as such, it's, it's a waste of material and uh, you'd essentially cover everything with what you deposit. Um, so in order to uh, combat this problem and really do it in a cleaner fashion, what our lab has largely been focusing on, this has been a technology that started in our lab and has been developed over the past, I, I would say decade. Um, and it's been a long evolution process, and that's organic vapor jet printing. Now, organic vapor jet printing is also a physical vapor deposition, but instead of doing this completely in vacuum, uh, it also uses a inert carrier gas. Now, as you'd probably expect, then the pressure that this tool operates under is a little higher because you're using gas uh, inside a vacuum. So it operates under 10 to the minus 4 tor. Um, and also, as you would expect from our previous introduction, um, the evaporation temperature for under this kind of condition would consequently be higher because it operates under a uh, low, a uh, higher pressure. So, to explain the differences between OVJP and uh, VTE from the previous slide, we can refer to the top right figure. So, uh, A is a depiction. Uh, is a different depiction of uh, VTE. And the, uh, essentially OVJP was evolved from uh, the VTE process and the missing link is actually in part B and the method is called OVPD. It's also been developed by our lab. Um, essentially it's a uh, larger version of the OVJP. There isn't any kind of nozzle whatsoever that guides the gas flow. It, it's essentially just the VTE, but you flow gas through it. Um, and in part C, we can see what the OVJP is. It's essentially a miniaturized version of the OVPD gas system. Uh, but now we can redirect this gas and selectively print on uh, different regions. So as we can see, the improvements are that we have we now have directional uh, patterning capability and the material doesn't go everywhere as demonstrated by uh, the coin that we can see here on the bottom right figure. Uh, and we can see individual dots being patterned. And as such, there is very high material utilization. We don't really waste much material. So now moving forward um, to explain a bit more about this technology. Now OVJP, uh, as we've mentioned, can be used to direct right uh, organic material. That's what the O stands for. So the most fundamental application is actually in display technologies, uh, specifically in OLEDs. So stuff that you would find in phones and TVs, these can be produced this way. Now the bottom right image shows three separate OLEDs. These are the lines uh, in red, green, and blue. Now this would meet a display application. So now when we talk about displays, uh, one key thing is the pixel density, essentially. And in order to make a high pixel density display, you'd need very small pixels. So this kind of resolution is afforded by the OVJP via micro nozzles, which are essentially uh, produced out of silicon. So the etching processes and everything that you use 
to make these nozzles are very similar to what the semiconductor industry has been using for the past few decades. And it's ideal actually for parallel and uh, scale production as a result. As you can see in the top right figure, uh, these nozzles can be made into arrays. Now, so some of the key challenges with OVJP are actually inherited from VTE. As I've mentioned before, uh, it, OVJP is a technology that was originally derived from uh, VTE. So the first one, obviously, is uh, that OVJP is also a line of sight process. Um, and to explain this more clearly, we can refer to the figure on the right. Now, we've brought back the uh, cartoon from the VTE slide, and that's shown up top. But now there's another cartoon uh, at the bottom for OVJP. And as you can see, uh, the material still goes in a certain direction. It's just that we currently have a much better control of where it goes. Uh, but th the fact is that it will still go where uh, it sees. So we cannot coat the backside, for example, of our sample uh, if our nozzle is at the front. Now, we've also mentioned that because we're operating at a higher uh, pressure, uh, we also require a higher temperature to deposit material. Now, this might be an issue because some of the materials we are working with are very heat sensitive. For example, the scaffold materials are composed of polymers, and if uh, the right steps to cool the uh, scaffolds aren't taken, then it may be possible that they get damaged. Th these are uh, problems that can be resolved, however. Um, so another issue that uh, wasn't really mentioned before is with regards to resolution. So now when we look at a typical display, um, the pixel sizes are on the order of tens of microns. Um, maybe even a few a few microns. Uh, but with respect to CellMet and the actual uh, cellular length scales that we're looking at, the we'll take a heart uh, muscle cell, for example. In an adult cardiomyocyte, uh, the sarcomere spacing is actually two microns. So in terms of adapting OVJP to tackle this kind of length scale, uh, it would still be something that we're working on. Um, now, Another issue is to generate such small patterns, we'd also have to move the uh, print head for the OVJP very close to the sample. Now, that would arise to an issue of how do we register such a close spacing. So in the bottom, uh, in the right figure, uh, there's a label H, and that represents height. Now, typically, this height to the nozzle diameter would be roughly one to one if we want to uh, achieve high resolution um, features. So figuring out how to uh, move two planes together in such a close fashion is also a challenge. Now, finally, of course, ultimately this process is still done in vacuum. So um, there are some other compatibility issues which may arise. Um, the key problem that we are trying to solve, however, is figuring out despite all these differences, how to integrate a inherently scalable technology with other ERC uh, processing techniques such as atomic calligraphy and uh, nanoscribe, which is used in Thrust2 for the scaffolds. So with respect to the three-plane diagram, uh, what we're currently trying to do is uh, we're trying to figure out what kind of materials that we can use as uh, molecular glues to interface with uh, cells. But additionally, we're also, as you can see from this presentation, we're also trying to figure out how to put such materials down. So there, there's a bit of knowledge base that's involved, but there's also a lot of development in technologies which we are currently working on. So uh, with respect to this then, what are the applications for OVJP then in the cell net? So really the most powerful feature of OVJP is that we are able to write uh, patterned uh, organic small molecules essentially on the surface in any fashion that we want. Now in the top right diagram, we see lines of organic material 
Um, these are actually OLED materials. Um, and uh, they can be done with very high resolution. The lines themselves are actually 20 microns wide. Uh, we anticipate that it's possible to go even smaller. And uh, just to show that these are actually OLED materials and they didn't degrade or anything, uh, to the right, uh, we can see them light up. So the bottom left is actually a logo of uh, our group, uh, the Optoelectronic Components and Materials Group. And this was actually written using the same OPJP system. So this is just to show that we can write in any arbitrary shape. Um, so in terms of the actual organic material itself, what we've come to find in uh, our past investigation is that it's, it turns out that these small molecules can actually be served as a negative for uh, other coatings. For example, stuff that we're working on right now is a functionalized perylene coating that's being done with Professor Lahan's lab, and those can be used as anti-cell adhesion layers. And essentially, our small molecules would just be windows in this layer where you can then attach other cellular glue material, whatever you need, uh, to generate patterns. And this is all in reference to some of the early pioneering studies, uh, as shown in the bottom right figure, where you have such cellular glue attachment points. These are the dots. And you can clearly see cells just uh, being guided by these dots. And really, we're trying to motivate um, this previous experiment and other experiments that's been done in the past, but being able to do this in a more arbitrary fashion. So as I've mentioned, cells can interface with the surface via proteins. And what we're essentially doing is patterning a negative for a anti-protein adsorption layer. So that would be the applications. So uh, the expectations that we have really in the future is that with this kind of technology, we can do mechanistic studies uh, for cell to environment interfacing. So by that, we just mean if we are able to pattern such uh, materials in any way we want, we can have better control over what we're observing. And um, to motivate this even further, this could give us better insight on how to engineer su more suitable tissue models, as this is one of the key challenges that Selma is trying to address. Now, in addition to this, uh, a lot of the technologies that we work on, for example, in our lab, are meant to be scalable. Um, so to the right is actually a tool that's currently in our lab. It's a roll-to-roll -roll, uh, processing tool. And essentially, what we envision is being able to take this entire, all the processing and put them in an assembly line like fashion to uh, increase production uh, and throughput for generating samples to allow uh, other engineers and scientists to accelerate testing. So in this demonstration, we'd be looking at a vacuum thermal evaporation system or VTE that's currently inside our lab that we use to make uh, solar cells with. So the reason why we use a glove box is because a lot of the organic materials are actually oxygen sensitive and we need to keep it in a purged environment using nitrogen. So this is the puck that we actually use to clip samples on and in very shortly you would see how we load this inside a chamber. So using a fork, we would now load this puck into a secondary chamber uh, that we call it a load lock. Now the use of this secondary chamber is to provide an intermediate uh, pressure environment between atmosphere and high vacuum. So the loading time into the chamber uh, is much shorter than if we just opened um, the VTE chamber on its own. So once we close this door, uh, we would be able to then pump down this uh, load lock chamber uh, externally using a computer, as you will now see. So the entire operation of this tool is computer controlled. And so with a pump down setting, we can begin the roughing stage for this load lock. And uh, the same chamber where you saw our sample being placed in is where uh, I'm indicating currently, and it is this tall uh, cylindrical 
chamber that's sitting between a gate valve as well as the glove box. So in order to load the sample in uh, to our particular system, we have to see a, using a fork uh, to transport this puck from the load lock into the chamber. And this fork is attached as part of uh, the vacuum chamber. So now we're just lowering the stage that was used to mount the uh, puck in. So shortly we would see this entire puck be retracted as it is currently at the right pressure. So once the puck is manually retracted uh, using this ra uh, rail system, uh, we can then proceed to lowering the uh, stage holder that's controlled uh, by a motor. And here you can see that the holder is lowering. So once this is lowered, we can push the puck back on to the uh, holder, that's the uh, stage. And this can be further adjusted uh, up and down, uh, depending on the deposition height that you want, or uh, it can be rotated. And shortly you would see uh, rotation, but this was done manually. So during operation, uh, we would typically rotate the puck along with the samples in order to provide a uniform service code.